John started writing for the Nation magazine around that time and uh, connected, identified the Unitarian Universalists as one of the leading denominations working on media issues uh, for reform. Because what was happening, if you could think back to the 80s and 90s, you had the Bush years after the Reagan years, and they consolidated media. Ben Beck Dickian, a leading Unitarian author, he was the editor of the Washington Post for a while. He wrote a book in 1980 published by Beacon Press, the Unitarian printing house, called The Media Monopoly. And that book is now in its sixth or seventh printing. But uh, Ben, 1980, said, what's bad is there's only 50 corporations running 90% of the media in the United States. Well, what is there now, John? Five or six? We're, we're lucky if it's five. Uh, so um, that sparked a lot of interest in the uh, 90s, and then the war, the Vietnam War came along. A lot of people realized the media consolidation that's being... Uh, uh, Vietnam. I do that all the time. Too many wars. <laughs> it's an endless war. And anyway, I don't want to tell uh, what John's going to tell, tell you, but I do want to say that uh, how much John has meant to many of us in the Unitarian uh, Universalist movement, and uh, we still work with the UUs for Just Economic Community, and we're waving a, um, a sign now. So some of us have formed a, a group called the Media Stewards Project, and uh, I'm on that uh, board, as is John Boyer. Raise your hand, John, so we'll know who you are. And uh, Patrick uh, Riley's here from California, uh, way in the back. He's keeping our eye on everybody. He's a back row kind of guy. And, uh, uh, but John has meant a lot, and he's helped found the movement Free Press. So the Free Press has had s five conferences around the country in the last decade working on these very issues with two, 3,000 people coming each time. To, to gather and work and make media one of the main issues. You know, if we're working on the social justice issue for schools, education, health, environment, the media has to be central to that so we could get the message out and, and make some social change possible. Um, so John has written several books. I've brought uh, some copies. The Genius, how many books have you written, John, 12? Maybe it's 10, between 10 and 12. Uh, so he's not pushing books, but he's going to have a new book out, and he's going to talk a little bit about that new book. But the past book is called The Genius of Impeachment. Here's a, a challenging book called The S Word. John's home is in Wisconsin. Were you born in Union Grove, Wisconsin? Okay, see, it's famous, isn't it? Union Grove. And he's uh, made his home in Madison for many years. He's a, a family man. He's been, who, who has seen John on television, on MSNBC, on uh, Amy Goodman? He's been on Bill Moyers. Am I leaving anybody out? <laughs> and uh, what's another book? The last time John, uh, one of the times, John's been coming to Boulder and uh, Denver and Golden since before Barack Obama got here. And he had, to do, he had to do the groundwork for Obama, you see. <laughs> and uh, so this was about the time that he, he and John Robert McChesney wrote The Death and Life of American Journalism when we did a UU Colorado tour, including uh, Golden, Boulder, and uh, Denver. So here we are, and uh, I'd like to uh, just welcome John to the First Unitarian Society of Denver, historic uh, area, and I'll turn the mic over to him. Very sweet. I feel very uh, naked here, you know, with my, just out with my microphone. Uh, and luckily, I don't have any, uh, any notes, so it'll make it very easy to do without all that. Henry Kroll, I just want to say uh, that as we've worked over the last 15 years to build a media reform movement in the United States, and had a remarkable level of success, but also great frustrations along the way. Uh, it would not be where it's at had there not been a handful of people in communities across this country, many of them Unitarians, although I'm not a Unitarian, many of them Unitarians uh, who 
organize again and again and again to make events just like this happen. And, and the one thing to understand is that the media reform movement is built across this country on groups of 10, 20, 30 people getting together in church basements and union halls and saying, hold it, this doesn't work. It does not work to have a media system that thinks what Donald Trump says matters <laughs> and what a thousand working people who organize a rally or who organize at their workplace or teachers who are trying to get decent funding for their school, that that doesn't matter. We have a fully dysfunctional media system in the United States, and that fully dysfunctional media system creates and underpins many of the most serious crises of our time. Now, that's something that I see of uh, watching you folks. I see you nodding. And, uh, and so you've been well, well instructed to believe these things. <laughs> but there was a time when people didn't rec begin to recognize that. And Henry Kroll, who was selling furniture, I think, in San Francisco, he's not some you know, retired newspaper man or something like that. Henry Kroll started organizing events in San Francisco years ago, and we would go out there, and it was this island of activism, and he is you know, in it for the lifelong struggle and a total hero. And he, has, and he looks exactly the same as he did 20 years ago. Henry Kroll. I want to thank the Media Stewards, which is a, a great group that's really working at bringing many of these issues into play, new ways of, of addressing some of the challenges. I want to thank the Unitarians for having me come over. That's very, very nice to be here. I want to tell you, I'm not a Unitarian. Got no taste for the religion. Uh, I'm a Quaker. And, you know, it's a, we're very competitive with the Unitarians. Uh, it's an ugly, there's some ugly street fights now and again, but, you know, obviously we don't throw any, we don't throw any punches, uh, you know, it's a, the Unitarians beat us up in kind of a bullying situation, we're much smaller, and I just want to tell you that, that uh, I, we had an experience with the Unitarians when I was a member of the Miami Friends meeting, it's a Quaker meeting in Miami, and there was this guy who was coming, I mean, Quaker meetings are tiny. There's, there's never a big crowd, right? And we're silent, so we don't even know what anybody else is thinking. And, and so we all sit around silently, and then afterwards we have coffee in a very proper way, and you know, like that. And so there's this guy who'd been coming to the meeting in Miami, and we were thrilled because it like doubled the membership. And, um, and I'm standing there with one of the, and, and Quaker meetings always, no Quaker ever dies. Uh, everybody's really old. And, you know, and it's generally really old women and, uh, who are the backbone of the Quaker meetings. And they obviously started as young women 200 years ago, and they are now running the meeting. And, but not really because we don't really have hierarchy. And so, but there was a woman who was clearly the dominant figure in the Miami meeting. And, we're, and I knew her very well. She's a wonderful woman. We're standing around talking after the meeting. And this guy, a relatively younger guy, comes up and he says, I love the Quaker meeting. This is fabulous. And of course, we're like, well, thank you. And because uh, the Quakers don't feel proud, but you know, we were sort of proud. And so this, this guy's like, he loved the Quaker meeting. Says, and, and this woman says, what do you love about it? And he goes, I love that we don't have to believe in God. And the woman goes, well, actually, <laughs> Quakers do believe in God. And he goes, yeah, 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 but not the not the Jesus part. You don't, you don't believe all that Jesus part of it, you know, and stuff like that. And she's like, well, actually, we do believe in Jesus. And he goes, yeah, but, but not like the Bible, you know, taking the Bible seriously and all that. And, and she says, young man, I believe you've confused us with the Unitarians down the street. <laughs> And I got a pack of Unitarian jokes, but I'm not going to tell them all because mostly you've heard them. Although there was a case, I, I, I hope, you know, me, and I know you're not all Unitarian, so some of you will find this amusing, um, that there was a, uh, a Unitarian family moved to a rural town in Colorado. And they were treated, you know, relatively politely, you know, not, not overly polite, but, you know, people weren't directly mean to them to their face. And, but after a couple nights, they're in their house, and 
they hear a crash out in the front yard. And the husband runs into the front room. And a couple minutes later, his wife comes in. Or, you know, she's like scared, comes, steps out. And he goes, shield the children. Don't let them in. Here. Don't let them come here and see this. And she's like, what? What is it? And he pulls the curtain open. He says, look, they burned a question mark in the front yard. Have you heard that yet? Have you heard it or not? It's a good Quaker. No, it's a Unitarian. See, we sit around at Quaker meetings and tell Unitarian jokes. <laughs> Tons of them. And you should hear us when we get going on the Church of the Brethren. But I am delighted to be with you tonight. And I am delighted to talk to you about some of these media and politics issues. We'll talk for a few minutes. I'll give you a little bit of perspective on some of the stuff we're working on. And then we'll take some questions. And, um, and then we'll go off into the night to change the world. Um, Bob and I have a new book coming out. Bob McChesney and I have been writing about these issues for years. And we've had you know, a minimal amount of success thanks to Bill Moyers and some other people, uh, Ed Schultz, our friend on, on MSNBC, and others who have given us a chance to talk about these things. Our new book tries to bring together a lot of different issues. It'll come out in June, making a fine holiday gift uh, for Flag Day or the 4th. Um, but the, uh, the new book tries to bring together a host of issues, and it's for a reason, and it's not a pretty reason. I've been joking a little bit here, but this is actually pretty serious stuff. We're in crisis as a country. We are in a very bad place. Now, it doesn't feel like that when you're in the cool, refreshing Unitarian meeting house, right? And it doesn't feel like that when you're with your family or your friends, uh, and it shouldn't. Crisis doesn't always feel bad. It's a weird thing. We think of crisis like when, you know, when our, when our girlfriend's breaking up with us, right? You know, in high school, that's a crisis, right? That's a bummer, right? Or when our kid didn't get into the right school or whatever. The fact is, most crisis isn't urgent. Most crisis is something that happens around us. It, it creeps into our life. And it's only at the last moment that we realize things have gone horribly awry. And usually, by that last moment, we don't have time to fix it. That's a crisis. You're driving home after a party, and you run out of gas, and you're out in the middle of the country in Colorado. That's a crisis, right? And it was coming on for a long time. You just forgot to look at the, at the gas meter as it was going down, 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 and you didn't think about it, because you could have pulled into that gas station, but you didn't. And now you're out on that country road, and there's not a, and no lights coming from either direction. And so that's what I mean about a crisis. They usually, they creep up on you, and then when they hit you, when it becomes real, it's too late to do much about it. Then you gotta hope somebody comes and rescues you. And then the person who pulls over doesn't look very friendly. Um, that's right, they've been drinking. <laughs> and, um, and the crisis that American democracy has at this point, and it is a crisis of democracy, is that we become a dollarocracy. And we're not fully there, but we are getting there very, very quickly. What do we mean by dollarocracy? Let's define the term up front so we understand. It's a circumstance where a bad idea, a failed idea, can dominate the discourse, even dominate the politics of the country because somebody's got enough money to pay to make that idea dominant. And even when the idea is discredited, it remains real. Even when the idea loses, it wins because the dollar matters more than the vote. And if the voters come and reject an idea, the dollar comes and buys it back into the discourse. Let me offer you a notion of how this works. And it's very immediate. We just had an election in the United States. You may have noticed Barack Obama ran against Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney wanted to make it very clear why he was running for president of the United States. He was running for president of the United States because he said the country was going bankrupt. We were broke. And in case you didn't get the message, by the way, that's false. We're not broke. One of the wealthiest countries in the history of the world with more concentrated wealth than almost any place ever in the history of the world. 
Uh, we are a rich, rich country with a rich, rich government. I mean, we don't, you don't even have to talk about tax and all that concentrated wealth. There's immense amounts of wealth sitting within the reach of our government. It's there. And so, I mean, that's wealth is calling as we speak to say hello. And so there's nothing broke about the United States. We are so incredibly rich that we were able to fight two wars, two unnecessary wars, and fight them off the books. We didn't even pay for them. And we're like, that's OK. We got money coming out of our ear. We're, we're rich beyond our dreams. We want to invade. And, and you know what? If they decide to invade North Korea tomorrow, we will have all the money we need to do it. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And don't hesitate. I heard Rudy Giuliani talking about invading North Korea just today on Fox. Um, but and, and let's, say, let's say crazy. I know this will never happen. But let's say a bunch of bankers and, and speculators come up with some insane idea that no responsible person would ever do, which is to take mortgages, break them apart, and put the dreck from the mortgages, the worst parts of it, into the secure parts of the mortgage so that you undermine the entire housing industry of the country, which then undermines the entire economy of the country, which then creates an unemployment crisis where we're shedding 800,000 jobs a month. That would never, ever happen because it's so insane. No one would ever do that. But let's say that if that did happen in the United States, do you know what would happen? We would vote to give them money the people who created the crisis. And we would allocate $800 million in October of 2008 to the people that drove the car off the cliff. And we'd say, here, let's put some money in the trunk. Because you're, you know. And that is how it works. We have so much money that when somebody makes an incredible error of judgment, we give them more money. We are not broke. In fact, it wasn't just 800 million. If you look at the details which Bernie Sanders brought out with his audit of the Fed, when we, when we bailed out the people who created the economic crisis of 2007, 2008, when we bailed them out, we gave them 800,000 up front, but we gave them commitments of four, 800 billion, I apologize, I can't even talk in these numbers, but $800 billion, we gave, we gave them commitments of $4 trillion in loans put into the Fed, which has been moving back and forth. Bernie Sanders, uh, what a great undercovered, we talk about a media that doesn't cover things, one of the great undercovered stories of our time, Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul. And when you get the socialist and the libertarian together, something is happening. They audited the Fed. What did they find? Incredibly enough, out of that, all that money that we released from our, our money that we committed to bail out all these banks and all these businesses, they were, when the United States was bombing Libya, we were providing funding to the Bank of Libya. We were giving Gaddafi money to build better shelters. Obviously not enough money to build a good enough shelter, but it was our money. We were bombing the people we were giving money to. And that's the best way to understand. We have so much money as a country that we can give money to people that we blow up. In fact, we've given a lot of money to people that we blow up. So we're not broke. But Mitt Romney thought we were. Now, to Mitt Romney's measure, we were broke because he wanted to keep doing things in the way he was. He also wanted Social Security to be privatized. And don't, we shouldn't mince words here. They, they always say, oh, we just want to, we just want to reform it. With all due respect, and we call ourselves media reformers, the reality is the term reform has become often the phrase you use when you want to destroy something. They want to privatize Social Security because the people who work on, on Wall Street aren't good at what they do. And so they've already got all your retirement, right? That's not, a, they're not very good at it though, so they want a constant stream of the public sector money coming in. Instead of putting it in secure places, they want to speculate with it. And imagine if they had succeeded before 2008 when they crashed the stock market. Wouldn't that have been a wonderful moment? They also want Medicare and Medicaid. They want Medicare and Medicaid because it's a great way to beef up 
the money that goes to private insurance companies, right? If we, have, if we say to elderly people, now we don't have any elderly folks in the room tonight, but if there was an elderly person in the room, I would ask them, do you really want to be given the choice, the choice of choosing between, you know, 8,000 insurance companies, right, for where to put your $6,000 voucher, which by the way, won't buy you sufficient insurance for your old age, right? I mean, but they love that because then you're gonna do that and then you're gonna go, because you're old and you're just like my mom, right? If such a person was in this room. Just like my mom, you're like, well, I shouldn't just get the $6,000 one because I might get sick. I should probably put 2,000 more, you know? And of course, that's the dream, right? You privatize Medicare, you create a voucher program, you give people vouchers, they go to buy insurance, and then you knock, you hit them up for a whole lot more. That's the underpinning of our financial crisis. It's not a crisis, it's that people want what we've got. They would all, you know, they'd like to break up the post office too. So he says we're broke. And then to emphasize it, he picks the poster boy for austerity in America. Because austerity has worked so well in Europe. And so they want to bring it to America. They pick the poster boy for austerity in America, the very buff, the very good looking Paul Ryan. And Paul Ryan is like, he's actually, he doesn't even fool around. He's, he actually said until like a year before he was running for vice president that he's in favor of these privatization schemes and all this crazy stuff. And he says it's the most, the critical crisis of our time is we're going broke, blah, blah, blah. So say all this. And we, now we got it, it's perfect. We have an actual election where there's an actual measure of a choice between people say we're broke and we got to do something about it and Barack Obama, who, you know, with all due respect on Barack Obama, 40 years ago he would have been a moderate Republican, right? You know, a centrist Republican that, that we kind of like, you know? I mean, it's like, he wouldn't be like a, you know, he's not like a liberal, but he's, he's you know, responsible. And so Barack Obama runs for re-election and he, you know, actually says, now I'm not sure that we ought to cut these programs apart. You know, I'm not sure that we should really, really take, deconstruct that which works in our country because some crazy person says we're broke. I think maybe we ought to protect them. And he also says, and I also think maybe we ought to invest in jobs. And instead of cutting our way out of our economic hard times, which has never worked in the history of the world, maybe we ought to grow our way out because that actually has some history of working. And the American people, not an irrational bunch, right? They look at their options and they say, you know what? We're going with the Obama strategy because it sounds like putting gas in your car before you run out of gas on the road. And, and so they reelect Barack Obama and he doesn't get reelected by a little bit. The, no one, I was in Ohio for MSNBC on election night, right? And so they said to me, they said, you're going to be there all night long. You're going to be there the next day, you know, because it's almost sure to be a recount. It's going to be so close. And oh, it's, oh, my, this is a tight, tight election because we're an evenly divided country. And I'm there and I'm like thinking, well, I'm going to make an extra buck, you know, and I get some, get in some chips and some soda and I'm ready for a long, an all nighter. And there I'm standing there and Rachel Maddow's on and she's being nice and, we're, and they flip into me and every once in a while you say a little bit and then they, you know, it's just like everything in TV, you say like 10 seconds and then you're gone. And so I'm trying to be insightful in my 10 seconds and I'm thinking, that's okay. I don't care that I've only got 10 seconds because I'm gonna be here all night long. I'm gonna be here at five in the morning. I'm gonna be here all day the next day. I'll be like one of those people that the beard's coming in, you know, and no, 11 o'clock comes. They're like, oh, Ohio went for, Obama, uh, it's over. He's reelected. Poor Karl Rove is sitting there on Fox. Going, you know, he's going, no, no, it's all right. I just, I, really, we fixed this thing. It's not going to work like that. And, and actually, you're wrong. It does. And of course, in classic, just so you know that sexism has not been completely obliterated from our society. Karl Rove objects to the results. He says they're wrong, right? So what does he do? He sends the blonde woman to check. Right? He doesn't go check. Wouldn't you check yourself? No. <laughs> so she goes back and she just comes back and she says, Carl, it's, it looks like Obama has won. He says, that's ridiculous. Well, no, Obama had won. But they couldn't believe it, right? Money couldn't believe. Power could not believe. This is not, no, 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 no. We had scared the American people into believing we were broke. 
right? That it was a crisis. They had to vote for us. They had to vote against their own interests. They had to vote for the guy who said, I'm not going to take care of 47% of you. And something went wrong. It wasn't right. So they, they, they were like, the next day, next morning, Haley Barber, the former head of the Republican National Committee, governor of Mississippi for many years, comes on television. And he says, it was almost a tie. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, the Kentucky Derby is almost a tie. <laughs> but somebody wins. And most basketball games are almost a tie. But they don't say, you know, like, like the Knicks almost won last night. No, they, it's, you know, somebody beat them. And, and, but on that night, they, when they said it was almost a tie, in the next morning, the margin for Obama was 250,000 votes. It wasn't that much, because in America, we have one of the most dysfunctional election systems in the world. I've covered elections in 20 countries. Most countries around the world, they are very, very good at counting votes. It's very, very important, because the legitimacy of the democracy depends on it. In America, we're lousy at it. It takes us forever, weeks, even months. And I get paid to see what the actual vote is. You don't, you have to go work. But I get to sit around and watch votes be counted over weeks and months. So Haley Barber says it was almost a tie. Week later, Paul Ryan comes back from hunting, you know, because he's very buff. And, you know, and so he comes back from hunting and he says, I haven't been paying attention, but I can tell you this, it was a close election. We're an evenly divided country. And I'm watching that and I'm thinking, wow, I mean, Paul Ryan says we're evenly divided, but yet the votes kept coming in. Here's an interesting thing. When they finally certified the last of the results from the 2012 election, which of course our media doesn't cover, but if we did cover politics in this country, they would have noted that Barack Obama won by five million votes, a five million vote margin. He won 51% of the vote, which doesn't sound like that much, except that you remember the Libertarian got 1%, the Greens got a half percent, all sorts of other things. And so amusingly enough, Mitt Romney got 47% of the vote, ironically. Um, and, but here's the interesting thing about that 51%. The interesting thing about the 51%. Barack Obama was the first president of the United States to have been elected twice with over 51% of the vote since Dwight Eisenhower. The first Democrat to be reelected twice without, with more than 51% of the vote since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And you're like, well, that sounds like he actually, you know, almost a mandate. It sounds kind of significant. And then, you, then it's like, oh, but no, no, no. His percentage of the vote, his margin of victory, was greater than John Kennedy in 1960, than Richard Nixon in 1968, than Jimmy Carter in 1976, than Bill Clinton in 1992 or in 1996, then George Bush in 2000, well, George Bush lost, but, but only in America do you lose and win, but, um, which is an optimistic notion. And, but, or in 2004, when George Bush was reelected and said, well, maybe reelected, depending on how he's count votes in Ohio, but, and, but after his reelection said, I have a mandate, I've got political capital, I'm going to spend it, right? So we have this history of, Winning by less than what Obama won by is a mandate to do something. And notably enough, Barack Obama's percentage of the vote in 2012 was greater than Ronald Reagan received in 1980 when Ronald Reagan said he had a mandate to fundamentally change how the republic operated. Now, you didn't see that in the media, did you? Not a lot of talk about that. Wasn't the front page of the... Colorado, formerly Rocky, now whatever remains. Uh, no, it was, it's a lost part of the story. And here's the interesting thing on it. When we have a media that does not cover politics well, that does not cover it with perspective and reality, we end up in a situation where the dollar can lose as it did. That was a mandate election, much bigger than anyone anticipated. Obama actually reelected by a very comfortable margin. Democrats supposed to lose control of the Senate, actually add two seats in the Senate. I admit, helped along by some gentlemen who have a little trouble understanding the concept of rape, uh, or at least getting it, you know, in a, in a right perspective. Um, 
But also another thing in the House of Representatives, races for House of Representatives, Democrats didn't win the House of Representatives. John Boehner said, oh, I have a, we've got a mandate to challenge Obama. Actually, no, you don't. One million point four, one point four million more people voted Democratic for the House of Representatives in 2012 than voted Republican. The only reason Republicans got control of the House was because of the crime of redistricting. They drew lines and they concentrated votes in a way that allowed them to maintain control of the House. So you have a full across the board mandate. President, overwhelming. Senate picked up two seats. House of Representatives, majority of people wanted. And so you would think at that point, somebody would say, okay, maybe we don't have to keep operating on this concept that we're gonna cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh-uh, what are we talking about right now? We are back. It's sort of like, you remember the movie Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray? Yeah. Right, you know, it's like every morning he wakes up, it's the same thing. Well, in that movie, at least you had the legitimacy of, you know, being in some town in Pennsylvania where that happens. Um, we don't even have that. You know, we're not stuck in some sort of loop. We are bought into a circumstance where bad ideas don't die. Zombie ideas walk among us because billionaires can put the money together and keep them in play. Why does that happen? Two reasons. Number one, our media has declined in ways that are beyond comprehension. And I want to emphasize to you, every major daily newspaper in the United States has cut its staff. And I don't mean cut a little bit. I mean cut in half or more. Newspapers across this country are giving, they made a decision, the people who own newspapers made a decision 20 years ago about the amount of staff it was required to cover a town. They're now telling you they only need half or less to do it. Why were they wrong 20 years ago? What has changed? Well, the news industry's gotten, the money's tightened up. Advertising's figured out other places to go. It goes to the web, it goes directly to you. So there are real economic challenges for our media. But the bottom line to remember is, you get less information, less quality information from media today than you ever have in your lifetime. And you say, hold it, I love John Nichols on MSNBC. He is fabulous. I like him when he's on with Moyers. That is great. Well, it's absolutely true. I'm, you know, give you what you need. But here's the bottom line. This is an important thing to understand about a democracy. If you took MSNBC, Fox, and all the other cable news shows, put them all together, put them all together, you wouldn't get 10% of the population watching it. In fact, New York Times, you think, well, New York Times is the most influential paper in America. It just must dominate everything. Do you realize how many people read the New York Times every day? Under 1%, right? 99% of people do not get the benefit of the New York Times. The fact of the matter is that when we look at the reality of our media environment, most of our news still comes from our local TV stations, from our, what was our local newspaper. From, we get it on our radio, in our car, and you say, well, I go on the internet. I get a lot of stuff on the internet. It's true, you do. But here's the interesting thing. Overwhelmingly, of the sites that you go to on the internet to get news from, they are overwhelmingly owned by the same institutions that have cut their staff dramatically. And so a tiny number of people are producing news. How does it work? Give you a quick example. Uh, the Pew Foundation does great studies on media. They studied Baltimore, Maryland, and they said, okay, how do people get their news in Baltimore? How do they get their news? Well, um, still, according to this study, and this was done just a couple years ago, it's not a long time ago, with all the new media and all the internet and everything that we love, and I live on this, I was tweeting before I came here, all of our new media, they studied it all, by the way. Pew studied how all the information comes to people. Newspaper, radio, television, Facebook, uh, Twitter, everything, websites, everything. They studied it all. They said, where does fresh information come to people, new information? They said, well, they determined 96% of it, 96% of it originates in what we traditionally think of as old media, right? Newspaper, television, radio, mostly the newspaper. In fact, overwhelmingly the newspaper. 4% generated by new media. Not because new media is not important, it's vital. We get a lot of our information from it, but the actual generation of news 
is not there. What an awful lot of new media does is comment on or even just aggregate what has been gathered someplace else. And I hate to tell you, sometimes cable news does that too. Most cable news shows don't have reporters. They have people who talk about what has happened. So we have a lot less people actually going out and gathering news. So remember, 96% to 4%. Let's say it's even evolving, because people are doing some great work on the web, and I do a lot of it. But let's say it's even 5%. You know, it's still overwhelmingly the old media. And you think to yourself, okay, well, that's good. Old media is doing the job. They also, this is what Pew found in Baltimore. The Baltimore Sun, the major daily newspaper there, would be the equivalent of your, of your daily here, right? The Post. The Baltimore Sun had dramatically cut its staff over the years. And so it was producing only 33, it was producing 33% less original news stories, 33% less than 10 years prior. 73% less than 20 years prior. So, remember this, you get most of your media, most of your information, fresh information from old media. But old media is giving you 73% less than it gave you 20 years ago. They go, wow, that's, that's a, that's a, that could be troubling. I might be concerned. I might not be getting as much as I should. And then here's where it gets even more interesting. This is where it got really interesting. Pew study, and they studied every, Everything, every way we communicate, Twitter, all this stuff. They said, okay, what's the, when you trace back, what's the real source of the story? Where did it really come from? Now, there's two ways that a story rises. One way is the way that we see on TV or in the movies, right? With a, a shoe leather reporter. And this lovely woman right here, she calls the paper up. She says, I live in a neighborhood and kids are getting sick and I think there's toxic something underneath something here, and I think people should check it out. I called my city council. They didn't do anything. What are you going to do about it? And the reporter on the paper, scrappy young kid, says, well, I'm going to go down to city hall and check the records. I'm experienced. I, you know, I know how to do this. I'm going to find out. And then once I find out about that, I'm going to confront the city council members. And I'm going to, you know, we think about it as a story that generates up from the grassroots, from real things that are going on, and, you know, it has genuine basis in news. The other way that a story gets into our media, right, a fresh story gets into our media, is if power decides it wants you to be talking about it. Press release, press conference, you know, media creating the story, you know, somebody creating a story that they want you to talk about. So Pew actually studied where was the source. Fascinating thing. They found out that in Baltimore, when they did this study, remember, you're getting 73% less news, but of that 73% of that less, Where's it coming from? 86% was public relations, press conferences, managed news telling you what to think about, how to respond to it. 14% met the standard of traditional journalism. So, and this isn't that, it's not propaganda, it's not like a pure propaganda, they want to lie to you. This is something much more serious than that. They have cut, cut, cut their staff, cut, cut, cut coverage to such an extent that what remains is a tiny staff totally overwhelmed and they're taking the press releases. They're taking the easy way out because they literally are understaffed to such an extent that they are not doing the job. That's reality. That's the reality of the journalism side. Now, keep that in mind. That's half a dollarocracy. Your journalism isn't providing you with the information you need. It's not providing Maybe you guys, because you're all you're out here on, what is it, a Thursday night in Denver, you're at the Unitarian Meeting House, you are undoubtedly the super citizens of the world who have read and studied, this guy's phone goes off all the time, and, um, you know, and he's going to turn it off. And, um, but, so, you're, you're very super citizens, right? But it's not like that for most people. There's a lot of working moms who have two kids and a lousy husband who isn't around, and they get up at 6.30 in the morning to get the kids off to school, and then they go to work at the first job that they have, which is at a McDonald's, and they work until the kid, they go and pick the kids up from school, and then they get the kids home, they get the babysitter there, and they go to their second job work in the drive through window at Wendy's, right? And they make no money, and uh, they barely make ends meet. They don't have health care. And the fact of the matter is, when they get home at night from all that and worrying about whether they're going to make it the next day, they're not quite prepared to go and study and to try and figure out which internet site they should trust, 
right? This is a person who relies on radio. This is a person who relies on a quick headline on the paper. And we're giving them less and less and less as citizens. So where do they get their information? Ah, saving grace in a democracy. Luckily, the United States Supreme Court has intervened. <laughs> headed by John Roberts. And what they have said is, we understand there is an information gap in the United States. People are not getting enough information. How can they govern themselves? How can we have a functional democracy? People need information. We know what to do. Let's let corporations and billionaires spend whatever they want on advertising and communications, and they will fill the void. And you're like, well, that's insane, right? That's, that is propaganda. That is saying that people are going to get their information about democracy, how, how things operate, coming from people who might be inclined to lie to you, might be inclined to try and get you to vote the way they want you to vote. And you're thinking, nobody would, no one in their right mind would do that, right? But that was the Citizens United ruling, right? That was exactly what they said. You can spend whatever you want. Here's what we found out in doing the research for our book. In the United States, in 2012, $10 billion, that's billion with a B, was spent on the campaigns, state, local, and federal campaigning. $10 billion was spent, mostly still on advertising, television advertising. Do you know what some stations around the country did? Because that's where the money goes, right? Do you know what some stations around the country did? They cut the People like, people who do television ads want to advertise around the news because people who watch the news tend to be the best citizens, the ones most likely to vote. So there were television stations around the country. There was so much advertising flooding in in states like Nevada, they cut minutes off the news to make more space to put ads. They happened here in Denver, Colorado. Of course it would. Yeah, swing state, very important. So you actually start squeezing out news, and you still got to gotta fit in the seven minutes of weather, right? You know, that it's a... It's, it was exactly because it, it, was, it was 58 in Denver, but it was only 56 in Boulder. And you got to get all that, you know, all there. And then there's a, there's a weather front coming in off Asia that'll be here in a week. And you know, all the stuff they do, all the satellite stuff, which is, by the way, socialism. I don't know if you're aware of this. The National Weather Service provides the weather, right? All the, they don't do research. No weatherman does research. It all comes from, from the government. Right? And so you get seven minutes of government reprocessed information, and you don't, they don't cover your city council. Right? So there's this constant squeezing of the news, and you are filling the void with massive amounts of advertising. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that's dollarocracy. That's how you create a dollarocracy. And in that circumstance, in that circumstance, Democracy becomes less and less viable. People can even vote for what they want. They can say, well, I'm not going to make Mitt Romney my president. They can elect Barack Obama. And yet, in that circumstance, the reality of the choice does not take. It does not hold because the dollars return to pressure the process again. And what I would suggest to you as we approach future elections is, that our elections and our politics in this country is less about, less about Democrat and Republican, less about conservative and liberal, progressive and libertarian and radical, less about all these things than about how we restore a functioning democracy to this country. And the answer to the question is not as complicated or frightening as you might think, because we've been here before. Nothing about this is new. And I know people are like, oh, no, 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 no. I'll tell you, this is the worst it's ever been. We love believing that it's the worst it's ever been. The fact is, it's not the worst it's ever been. I can, I can guarantee you, this is a country founded on the original sin of believing that some of our people were three-fifths of human beings. That was in our Constitution. We had a rule in our Congress for the first 60 years of the American experiment that you couldn't bring up slavery. You couldn't mention slavery, so you couldn't have a debate about it. You know, and so we let this crisis fester and fester and fester until we had a civil war. We have had a lot of problems in this country that have gone unaddressed for a long time. 
And one of the worst moments as regards what we're talking about right here was from the post-Civil War moment through 1900, where we allowed a gilded age to rise in this country. We allowed robber barons to literally, I mean, in nothing you hear, no story you hear from Bangladesh, no story you hear from India or the, the, the toughest of circumstances in the world of what happens economically would be foreign to what people went through in the United States 150 years ago. It's important to understand, in this state, when people tried to organize unions, they shot them. They hung them. Uh, there were, you know, children working, oh, it's, a, you, it's, it's inhuman what happens in Bangladesh. There's children who make soccer balls. In America, children worked. You know, there were bobbin girls in the mills. And, you know, they would lose, they would lose their fingers at, at the age of six or seven, running, carrying, you know, this is, the, we had a gilded age in this country. We had robber barons who decided who won and who lost elections. We had a media that deferred to that power. And we broke it. We broke it with a progressive movement a century ago, century, 120 years ago. And here's the interesting thing. If you look at the American, the history of the American experiment, we have ages of reform. Because people always say to me, well, what, what's the fix? How do we fix our problem? What are we gonna do about our media? What are we gonna do about our politics? What are we gonna do about redistricting? What are we gonna do about, you know, just list the problem, the electoral college? How are we gonna fix all these things? And you're always like, well, there's so many problems. Where do we begin? Where we begin is recognizing a broad-based crisis that runs across all these different lines. And that dollarocracy does not exist because of bad media solely. No, because you got the money in politics thing. But it also doesn't exist solely because of money in politics. You've got the bad media. And it doesn't exist solely because of redistricting. You also got the money in the media. And it doesn't exist solely because of all these other challenges, even in education, they all interplay. And what is an age of reform? What do I mean by an age of reform? In this country, and this is an important thing to understand, in this country when we've been in a crisis situation, we have had moments where we decided we're gonna try and fix everything. And you're like, whoa, fix everything? What do you, that's amazing, how do you do that? Well, let me give you an example. In 1910, in the United States of America, women couldn't vote. Okay. Children worked in factories. We didn't have an income tax, and so as a result, um, you couldn't have the money to fund a government that could actually fund things like education and do so all sorts of other stuff. We had a United States Senate that was appointed in back rooms by powerful political players. People bought U.S. Senate seats because we didn't have an elected Senate. That was in 1910. In 1920, women could vote. We had an income tax, which actually changed, made possible the New Deal and all these things that came after. And, and, so those are two pretty good things. We also had an elected United States Senate where the people suddenly had the ability to have definitional role in their governance. In a 10 year period, you're like, wow, how did that happen? And during that same period, we passed some of the initial core labor laws in this country, we passed some of the initial core child labor laws in this country, we restructured, radically restructured how this country operated in a 10 year period. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. And today, I have people say to me, well, we couldn't possibly pass a constitutional amendment to overrule the Citizens United ruling of the Supreme Court. That's, that's impossible, it's too hard. You can't amend the Constitution. It's, it was written by you know, sage scholars, vir virtually biblical people 200 years ago, and nothing can change about it, Michelle Bachman. And, um, you know, and it, they will. They say, it's a, you, know, you can't change the Constitution, right? right? Well, how did we change things in between 1910 and 1920? We amended the Constitution to say women can vote. We amended the Constitution to create an income tax. We amended the Constitution to make an elected United States Senate. How do we change things in the New Deal era? What did we do in the New Deal when Roosevelt became president? We amended the Constitution to say that the Congress of the United States, which historically had sat for a year after the election and had the power to, to basically undo election results, had to be sworn in in January after the election. That was a constitutional amendment. We amended the Constitution to change when the President of the United States was sworn in so that you had a more immediate transition of power, which made it much harder 
for economic interests to control things. We actually created it. We built out the Federal Reserve in a functional way to challenge the power of the banks. We, in the 1930s, during that same period, we called J.P. Morgan before the U.S. Senate Banking Committee to explain the Depression. We put 2,000 people in jail for economic crimes, for creating the crises that led to the Depression. We don't do that anymore. You know, but the fact of the matter is that when you look at an age of reform, a moment of reform, you can do amazing things. The best is 1960s. 1960, most African Americans still couldn't vote in this country. We're denied structurally access to the polls. We had lots of other problems. Young people couldn't vote. 18 to 21, you, got, you, you could be sent to die in a war, but you couldn't vote on whether you thought the war was a good idea. We had all sorts of other, a lot of other problems going in there. Here's the interesting thing. 1960, 20% of Americans lived in poverty. Let's look at what happened 10 years later. Only 13%, 12, 13% lived in poverty. What changed? Well, in the middle of that decade, we created Medicare and Medicaid. When you gave seniors and people with disabilities access to health care, they no longer lived in poverty. It was a fundamental shift in how things operated. But that wasn't even constitutional. 1962, we amended the Constitution of the United States to eliminate the poll tax. We started to say, no, you can't block people from voting because they're poor or because they are people of color. You started to undo that. Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act. And then we finished the decade off by saying those 18 to 21-year-olds, yes, we're going to give them the right to vote. They can vote on whether they want to go to war. It's an age of reform. It's a moment where fundamental things change very, very rapidly. And you say to yourself, well, yeah, but that was the 60s. Can't, we can't get back there. Or that was the 30s. We can't, this woman's going, yes, we can. Yeah, that was the 30s. We can't get back there. That was the 1910s. We can't get back there. That somehow we can never, ever again recreate a moment where there is a genuine age of reform, where we genuinely say, let's go out and fix a whole bunch of problems all at once. Let's address the crisis of our media by fully funding public media and creating independent and not-for-profit media that will fill the void, the information void. Let's amend the Constitution of the United States so that corporations and billionaires do not define our political discourse in this country. Let's amend the Constitution to say that you cannot redistrict so that people don't have meaningful choices. Let's get rid of the Electoral College. Let's make real changes in this country. And let's look at economic justice changes that are appropriate and necessary. You say, well, we couldn't possibly do that. And yet we have. We have done it again and again and again in the history of this country. In fact, were it not for those moments, this country wouldn't be this country. We would not be where, we would not have the opportunity to even think in this way. Bottom line is, you want to think about where our politics ought to go? Think about something more than Democrats and Republicans. Think about the absolute necessary belief in a new age of reform. We need it now because we are in a crisis. And the question is, as you think about, and this is more than enough people to make any change, always starts in a room, you know, Chairman Mao said in China, give me three people in every village, I'll, I'll run the country. Three committed people, and, you know, and we've had variations on that, the civil rights movement in the United States brilliantly, you know, they said, boy, A. Philip Randolph, the great civil rights organizer, said, give me a couple people in every town, he was the Brotherhood of Sleepy Car Porters, give me a couple of good union men in every town, we'll, we'll make the change. And you know what the interesting thing about it is? He was right. He was absolutely right. He had, he had, a couple of his union guys down in Montgomery, Alabama. And the interesting thing is they paid the money to send a young secretary, Rosa Parks, up to the Highlander School to get trained in activism. And then when Rosa Parks said, I'm not going to sit in the back of the bus, those union guys, that couple of union guys in Montgomery called A. Philip Randolph says, you know, I think we're going we're to have a bus boycott down here. And A. Philip Randolph said, that's cool. We'll get your resources to back it up. And by the way, that young pastor you got down there, Martin Luther King Jr., we're going to back him up and help him out. Seven years later, A. Philip Randolph organized the March on Washington for Civil Rights and Jobs in 1963 and invited that young pastor, Martin Luther King Jr., to give a speech. It had some impact. The fact of the matter is you start with a group of people who decide we are just not going to do this anymore. We're not going to be on the Groundhog's Day cycle of allowing a bad media and a bad politics to give us constant crisis.
and to get us to that point where we're stuck on the road. We're just not going to go there. And there are ways to do this. There are ways to get engaged now. Free Press, the group I'm involved with, we've got a conference here this weekend. We're going to talk about a lot of these issues. And there really are people organizing. But it's not just us. There's a wonderful movement, Move to Amend. It's a group of people who are trying to amend the Constitution to address some of these issues. And you think, well, that's crazy. You know, just, you can't amend the Constitution. We've only done it 27, 28 times. So, you know, it's like, well, here's the interesting thing about Move to Amend. They have, they, they, to get a constitutional amendment in this country, to get there, you either have to have Congress act or you need to get 36, 37 states to do it. You know, they're a third of the way there already. They've had legislatures in a third of American states act on this issue already. They put the issue on ballot across this country. Do you want to know the interesting thing about when they put the question of whether we should amend the Constitution to get big money out of politics? You know what happens? Conservative towns, liberal towns, even in towns in Colorado, 75, 80% votes in favor of it. It's the interesting thing about if we start to believe in a better politics, if we start to believe we can actually shake this thing up, not accepting the politics they give us, but demanding something real, that's what Move to Amend does, that's what Free Speech for People does, that's what Free Press does, that's what Common Cause is doing, that's what the Unitarians are doing by embracing a host of meaningful reforms. The fact of the matter is, I don't suggest this because I think it's a nice idea. I don't suggest it because I think it's a good idea. I suggest it because I think just as it was in 1910, just as it was in 1932, just as it was in 1962, these are, this is necessary now. We can't not do it. And so I don't really care how you get engaged, and I don't care who you engage with, but this is the time to do it. Because elect, just electing another Democrat, even a good Democrat, isn't going to solve all your problems. Just electing a good liberal isn't going to solve all your problems. Or if you happen to be a conservative, electing a good conservative isn't going to solve all your problems. Because the fact of the matter is, the crisis that exists in America is a crisis for Democrats and Republicans, for liberals and conservatives. And the fact of the matter is, the reason we have so much anger and so much bitterness and so much cruelty in our politics now, and we do, we have an ugly, ugly politics, and you know it. The reason that's there is because people on the left and the right can't see a way out. All they can see is beating the other guy. What we need to offer them, left and right, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, is a way out. And the way out is to say it doesn't have to be this way anymore. We can amend our Constitution to get money out of politics. We must do it. We can make a better media system. Every country, every developed country in the world has a better media system than we do because they fully fund public broadcasting. They fully fund independent media. Give it, do you know what the proportion between Slovenia and the United States is on funding of public broadcasting? 75 to 1. We're the 1. They're the 75. In Norway, their funding level, the funding levels of public broadcasting to, uh, versus America is roughly 40 to 50 to 1. In Canada, it's 20 to 1 compared to us. We are the outlier. We don't do the basics. And if you want to fill the void of a declining media, you got to do something about it. These are doable things. The reform is possible, but it's only possible if that's how we think. And I'll close with this. The simple reality is that the biggest crime of our time is the suggestion that this is the end of history. And there was a, uh, Fukuyama wrote 20 years ago uh, in this book, after the fall of the Soviet Union, he said, this is the end of history. And everybody thought that was a brilliant idea. Oh, it's the end of history. Now, and Fukuyama's argument was we'd have liberal democracy and free market economics, and that was it. It was the end of history, and this is the winner, right? The Soviet Union lost, and Ronald Reagan kind of visioned that's what won. Okay? Interesting thing. Now, Fukuyama has since become a liberal, so he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily even believe all these things himself. But here's the interesting twist on it. A friend of mine, Tony Benn, who was a longtime parliamentarian, parliamentary, parliamentarian in Britain, was uh, in India and being interviewed. He was in, he was in uh, Calcutta. 
and they wanted to ask him about Fukuyama's argument that it was the end of history, that this was, this was it. The way that these things worked, this is how it was going to be. And so he comes on an Indian TV station, and the interviewer says, well, what do you think about this idea of the end of history? And he says, you know, it's a funny thing. As I walked here to the studio this morning, to the streets of Calcutta, and stepped over people sleeping in the streets, I was surprised that they weren't up dancing and saying, this is the end of history. We can live like this forever. No. <laughs> you know, this notion that we are where we're going to be, that this is what it is, it's always false. And the best approach to it is that of Claude Levi Strauss, the great uh, student of all the great civilizations of history. Claude Levi Strauss, who only died not that long ago, the French scholar, he, was at, he would always be asked, he'd say, he says, what was the greatest civilization of all time? What was the pinnacle of humanity? And he would say, say, that is the most disempowering question ever. That's the worst question you could possibly ask. Because it presumes that we can't make the greatest moment in history. That there was something in the past that was better than what we are. Or that there's some fantasy, some ideal somewhere in the distance. But that, because people always wanted him to say that. They desperately wanted him to say, yes, the Roman age or the, the Greeks or, or this. And what Claude Levi Strauss said, says, no, that's the wrong way to think about it. The golden age is in you. Whatever hasn't worked can be made to work. Whatever is flawed can be addressed. We, the golden age is not in our past or beyond us. It's in us. And that's the way that if we are to be even minimally useful to our fellow human beings and to this community, this state, this nation, this world, we have to start to think that the golden age is in us and that this can and must be a new age of reform because anything less will keep us on that road to crisis and we will end up on that country road without gas and with no headlights coming our way. We've still, we're in a nicely lit room, we've got some gas in the car, we've got some energetic good people, I would suggest to you, instead of fretting and moaning, let's go out and make fundamental change. It's no longer a compromise option. There's not a middle ground. We gotta fix it. Thank you very much. I think we're going to do it this way. Here we are. Can you hear this all right? Well, John, that was uh, uplifting, just what we needed, because uh, there's a lot of people that are uh, not in the room, and they don't feel the same way. I think that, uh, so we knew that coming here tonight, uh, we'd get the, uh, the gist of what's going on and a hopeful uh, core. And then people, if they want to go to graduate school, yeah, they, they could come tomorrow, Sheridan Hotel, and there's a special rate for people from Colorado. For the three, in, they, well, I, yeah, the people that sneak in, they know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Unitarians wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> Quakers would. No. <laughs> okay. Well, we have in our questions for. Okay, folks. I have. We have in our midst uh, uh, a special uh, guest who's here, uh, a former state senator and perhaps uh, uh, one of the leading uh, advocates in Colorado for. Uh, political reform, uh, such as you've been talking about. That's uh, former state senator Ken Gordon. So we're going to oh. give him the mic. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to make this. This is, there would be a question mark at the end of this. Um, first, I'm I'm really excited to read your book. I'm sorry that I can't get one now. It'll be here in June. Okay. Um, some of you know, I, I was in legislature 16 years. I ran eight elections. I never took a PAC contribution. I always thought that the way we financed campaigns in the United States was destroying our democracy. So I, when I left, I started uh, cleanslatenow.org, which supports candidates who don't take PAC money. And we had a big uh, win this summer. Uh, we supported Jovan Melton in a Democratic primary. We also support, supported a Republican. And Jovan won by 50 votes. We made 11,000 volunteer phone calls for him. He tells me that he knows he wouldn't have won without our support. And uh, 
he said that it was the best thing, this would be useful for you to know too, he said it was the best thing he used at the door. When he was walking door to door, he told people he wasn't taking PAC money, and uh, he beat the fellow who was the husband of the current legislator at that time. So he was pretty connected, so Jovan won a tough race. And, and what I tell candidates is, the people don't want you to take PAC money, and, if you can, and, and they will give you money to not do it. You'll be able to raise money from individuals, and they'll vote for you. But most candidates are uh, extremely timid. They don't want to annoy any of the wealthy interest groups that fund campaigns. So the other thing I have to tell people is that the highest form of participation in a democracy is being a citizen, and that all the elected officials work for you, and you need to tell them what you want them to do, like any other employee. And unfortunately, most Americans can't even name their elected officials who are their employees. So that's a job that we all have. So I've heard John speak many times. I've seen him on television. I think he's a hero. And I'm glad to have a chance to be here. And thank you for letting me have this again. And uh, isn't that so? I, I just, <laughs> everything you said, I've agreed with so far. Okay. All right. He's selling himself short. I just got a recent email from uh, Ken. And I don't know who else is on your mailing list. But if you're going to sign up the mailing list, could you hold that up? The uh, clipboard you have, John? Yeah. So anybody signing up, we're going to share this with Clean Slate now. We're going to share it with people that are working for democracy, free press, Unitarians for Just Economic Community. And, uh, but you had a very provocative email, at least I, a thoughtful one, comparing the environmental movement that's looking at the climate degradations that's heading the planet, that's endangering our planet, and you made some comparison to the democracy endangerment that we're in, which we heard John talk about. Could you talk a little bit of your thinking? Well, yeah, I mean, you see, see, a lot of times, I, I speak about money in politics all the time. It was, when, like I said, in 1992 when I ran, I didn't take PAC money. I was the only person elected in either party in the state who didn't take it and won. So I've been speaking about this since 1992. And a lot of people will say to me, well, yeah, that money in politics, that's your issue, but what I really care about is health care. Or what I really care about are jobs and the economy. Or what I really care about is education. And what I say to them is you can't get what you want until you deal with my, my issue first. As long as the money uh, is controlling our politics, there's a money side and a people side of many issues, and the money side's always gonna win. So that's what you have to turn your attention to. You're not gonna get health care while the insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies are writing our insurance, I mean our health care policy. You're not gonna have fair wages or, or, jo or good jobs as long as the banks and the hedge funds are doing all of the policy making about the economy, we're not going to protect the environment. The whole world can be destroyed because people are seeking these short-term profits and benefits for themselves so they can have more um, material possessions than their neighbors because they're in a competition with their neighbors to say we did better and we're gonna destroy the whole world because of that because uh, we're letting money and these short-term desires of these human beings control our government. And, um, you know, I, I fight this fight all the time, and uh, I started Clean Slate to do it, and, I, and, and I'm really, like, I, I'm not kidding. I really am interested in reading uh, John's book because um, sometimes I don't know what to do next, you know. For instance, I'll tell you the, the truth. Right this minute, this today, I'm trying to decide whether I should run for Secretary of State again. I ran in 2006 and got over 49% of the vote. I've also got clean slate now, I can't do both, and I'm trying to decide whether it would be more effective for the issues I care about if I were to run myself or to keep supporting other candidates who don't take PAC money, so. You should run. You think so? That's what I say, yeah, yeah. There you go, thanks, sir. Let me, uh, I got it. Um, let's, but let, let's, take, let's go off what Ken said for one second here, because that's really important. Ken just said, you know, first off, you should run, by the way. It's the, because uh, I hate to tell you, I hate to tell you that in the zone we live in, winning those Secretary of State jobs and getting somebody decent in them is definitional. And, and my friend Mark Ritchie is the Secretary of State up in Minnesota. He is an absolutely fair-minded, decent guy. He happened to be elected as Democratic Farmer Labor Party, but he plays it straight. 
And here's what Mark was able to achieve as Secretary of State. In 2008, he made sure that they had a fair count of the Franken U.S. Senate race, and that fair count put Al Franken in the United States Senate and gave them that critical breaking point for the votes they needed to actually pass some fundamental stuff in that first two years of the Obama. So it matters there, but it matters even more because of what he just did this last fall. They had a constitutional amendment proposed to do a voter ID law where they were going to make everybody go through an incredibly restrictive process to cast their vote. He succeeded in getting local clerks, county clerks, and officials all across that state to stand up and say this is a bad idea. And they beat a voter ID law at the polls. They kept voter suppression off the Constitution of Minnesota. So a Secretary of State matters, period. It matters. Now, let me tell you one other thing that Ken said that's important to keep in mind here. And that is, he said, nothing you want, you're going to get without campaign finance reform. So unless you fix the way money in politics operates, we're going to end up in the same place. And I'm going to tell you, nothing you want, you're going to get without media reform. Unless you fix the way media operates, you're going to end up in the same place. Well, hold it. How do we reconcile this? What are we going to do? Because Ken's right, and I'm right. And you know what? I'm also right about redistricting reform. Nothing that we want are we going to get unless we have fundamental redistricting reform at the state and federal level in this country. You can't have uncompetitive elections where winners get to draw the lines so that they never face a challenge. And so he wants redistricting reform, and he's right about that, and I'm right about media, and Ken's right about money and politics. We're all right. What are we going to do? Well, the answer is we have got to stop thinking there's a single cure for the crisis. We've got to break ourselves out of that pattern. And let me give you a, a metaphor for how this works. I, come, I grew up in a community and in a world with an awful lot of gay men. And when I was a young man, my friends started dying of AIDS. And not in small numbers, a lot of them. And you're not supposed to go to funerals when you're in your 20s, right? It's maybe an accident now and again, but we were going to a lot. It was happening a lot. And everybody had a cure for AIDS, right? It's going to be vitamins or surgery or this or that. Everybody's got, oh, there's so many answers for the problem. And yet nothing was working. And people kept dying. And then there was this Taiwanese-American scientist who took all the different cures, all the different drug regimens and different medications, and he said, we're going to create an AIDS cocktail. We're going to encourage people to take a variety of these different drugs, hoping for an interaction that keeps you alive. And maybe somewhere down the line, we're going to find an even better response to this crisis. But in the meantime, let's try and take the risk of putting it all together, trying to do all the things and see if we can make it work. And you know what? Friends of mine who were in those initial experiments, who took those AIDS cocktails, are still alive today. They stopped dying. And some of them have actually returned to pretty robust health. And so the bottom line on this is, we've got to stop thinking there's a single cure for the crisis. There isn't a single cure for the crisis. If we got rid of all of the ads on television, but still had a lousy media, we would still have the crisis. If we got rid of all of the ads and we fixed the media, we would still have lines drawn to make our districts uncompetitive and unfair and to create false results politically. The bottom line is we've got to become full spectrum reformers. We've got to really believe in fixing the thing because the problem is that big. And if we don't start to think that way, break out of these, these traps and these sim simple cures, we're not going to get there. And I'm going to tell you, every year, now we're in the crisis stage, every year we let pass, it will get worse. The amount of money spent in 2012 on politics was almost double 2008. That's what I'm saying. It's, and it, the only thing that increases faster is, is health care costs. And so bottom line is, now's the time. And again, I look at this group, and you think, oh, well, you know, there's not that many of us here. 
you know, we've got a few dozen folks. Give me a few dozen folks who actually believe and actually go out and do the work. We're fine. We make it. We make it. Because I hate to tell you, this is a fascinating thing. You know, I was at the Common Cause Conference. Uh, they had a 40th anniversary of Watergate. All these people gathered to honor the 40th. It was fabulous. Daniel Ellsberg was there. And Daniel Ellsberg sitting up on the stage, and he said, you know, at one point, I remember Alexander Butterfield, the former Nixon aide, he told me this story. And I don't know if he's still alive. And there was a stir in the room, and it was Alexander Butterfield raising his hand. <laughs> they were all there. It was an amazing event. But here's the interesting thing. I asked people who were big reformers, big activists from the Watergate era, I said, what did you have going on at the grassroots around the country? And, and Ken, this is really significant for you. I said, how many people were, you know, really pushing for reforms and stuff like that then? And they said, and they said, truthfully, nothing like we have now. There are more people working to amend the Constitution today than there ever were on the ground in 1973, 74, dealing with Watergate. That's one of the reasons why Watergate didn't give us reforms that were sufficient to deal with the crisis. Because this is not going to come from politicians in Washington. This is going to come from absolute demands from the grassroots. And there are more people doing it now than there have been at other periods in history. We have the, we have the groundwork for age of reform. We just have to pull it together. Any other questions? Or, let's, I apologize for talking so much. Yes. My favorite, my favorite driver up front here. Yes. Here we go. I was just going to ask, um, you know, you mentioned all the previous uh, Ages of reform, um, were they as contentious? Yep. I would I would believe that they were just as contentious, and you know you had people the status quo. No, we need the reform. No, we need some reform. No, we need all reform. It's a, no, so I mean, it's something. Yeah. It was. Av I can't emphasize. I'm a historian. It was as bad. It's been as bad as this before. And I know how desperately we want to say that we live in the worst of all times. You know, we do. We, it's the same as, because we're, you know, Coloradans know this, right? You say, boy, that was quite a snowstorm. And they're like, oh, man, this was the worst I ever saw, right? You know, it's like, it's always the worst, right? We want to believe that because we want to believe we're strong enough to survive the worst. We're not. It isn't. It was worse. It has been worse. Much worse. It, we lived in times when parents sent their six-year-old daughters to work, to dangerous jobs. And the children were given the worst jobs because they were expendable, right? We, that is our, our history. We lived in times, we lived in times where soldiers came back from World War II having fought to protect their country. And when they went to register and vote in Mississippi, they were shot dead. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough moment for reform, right? And yet it happened. Medgar Evers, a World, a World War II vet, shot in his driveway, coming home from a civil rights me meeting. We, this country, doesn't do reform easy always. It's not pretty, and it's not, it doesn't come as fast as we like. But the fact of the matter is they've always been contentious, and there's always somebody who says you can do just a little reform. The, great reform, the greatest reformer of all time, in my view, Robert M. LaFollette, the progressive senator from Wisconsin, uh, who Robert M. LaFollette was asked about a, a reform, and they said, well, you know, he was the person who pushed for direct primaries to give people control of their own political parties. He was the person who pushed for direct election of the Senate, the person who was a great champion of the women's rights. Many of these constitutional amendments we talk about, LaFollette, one of the primary proponents of it, with radicals from Colorado as well. And the interesting thing is they once said to LaFollette, well, can't you just accept a little bit of compromise? Why don't you do just a little bit of reform? Why don't you be a little more like Calvin Coolidge? And, and La Follette said, says a little bit of reform is like a little bit of bread. It dulls the appetite for a real meal, right? Sometimes a little bit of reform is not the answer. Sometimes a lot of reform is the answer. And so yes, it will be contentious, and you will have people who tell you, that what you're trying to do is not is you know just impossible, and I've got a great friend John Bonifaz who is a uh, he's a executive director of Free Speech for People, one of the constitutional amendment groups, and Bonifaz Bonifaz is a constitutional lawyer. He's a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, 
So he's like smart. And the interesting thing is that what Bonifaz argues is amending the Constitution of the United States is more frequent and common than comets in the air, than getting hit by lightning, than, you know, there's like a whole bunch of things. He, he makes this whole argument that actually amending the Constitution is a, is a pretty easy thing. We've done it a lot in this country. Making fundamental reforms is a pretty easy thing. We have done it in this country. And the only reason that we don't do it more is because they tell us it's so hard. Well, we have got, I, I know that it's, a, it's an intangible, it's a hard thing to, to communicate to people. But the biggest problem we've got is that we're not idealistic enough. We know too much. We can talk ourselves out of too many things. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, if we don't talk ourselves out, the media will. There's, when we were doing the Florida recount back into, a friend of mine said she read one of my books about the Florida recount. We are doing the Florida recount back in 2000, after the, after the Bush v. Gore vote in Florida. There were people who said, we've got to settle this thing. The country can't handle not having a president for two more weeks. And you're like, we, what? We couldn't handle not having George Bush as our president? I mean, you know, I, with all due respect, we gave him the presidency and he led us into an illegal and immoral war that wasn't necessary. If he hadn't been president, it might not have been as so bad. So the fact is, they will tell us that things are so urgent and that we can't possibly do what we need to do. The fact of the matter is, there was a simple solution to the Florida fight. If, if indeed it's true that you really couldn't count those votes accurately, that it was too confused, too much of a mess. I actually happen to think Gore won by a pretty, pretty substantial margin. But if you couldn't count the votes, and remember the Supreme Court stopped the counting of the votes because they said it was such a mess, right? Then you have a new election. We're a democracy. We are, we are supposed to be a democratic republic. If you can't count the votes, you don't say, well, I was appointed to the court by this guy's dad. I think we make him president. And that's what happened in this country. And the best way to understand it, I was in Africa for a period early on in the, uh, in the recount process. I only bring this story up to tell you how things could be different and how if we actually believed in things, we might do a little better. It says in Africa, a friend of mine from Zimbabwe said, said, let me get this straight. In the United States of America, somebody wins the most votes, but they don't become president? And I said, yep, that's the case, because we have an electoral college. And he says, yeah, yeah, and I don't get the electoral college fully. And I said, neither does anyone in America. And he said, well, but, but, but I think I understand how it works, that if you got everything you know, all settled in the country and somebody wins the election with the most votes, if there's one province down in the corner that's run by the brother of one of the candidates, they get to say, no, we don't like that result and we're gonna produce a different result. And, and I said, well, yeah, sorta, and if, Florida. And then, he, then I said, he said, yes, is it? And then if somehow they do start to count the votes and they get it right down there or something like that, then it goes to a, a court in Washington where the members of the court are made up of people who are appointed by the dad of the one candidate and the guy who the dad of the one candidate worked for as vice president? And I said, yeah. And he said, I get it. America operates like a country that America would say, if you keep doing this, we're going to cut off your foreign aid because you're not a functional democracy. <laughs> well, we, we oughtn't be that. Let me take this. Jimmy Carter would be Uh, well, yeah. My, my question is, uh, it, 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 it seems to me that being right, I mean, having the correct answers is now a drawback. Uh, would you like to comment on that? I get your point. So like if you believe that there's global warming, you somehow are, you know, crazy. Um, no, we, we do live in an era of anti-intellectualism, right? We live in an era where we are told that having the answer 
is not a good thing, right? Um, somehow having the question is okay, but not the answer. And the interesting thing about it is, it's like they sometimes say to you, you can have your own opinion, but you can't have your own facts. <laughs> not anymore. Now we have our own facts. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that it is our media that reinforces this. Because we do not have the media. Now, we have some younger folks in the audience but um, who are busily ch texting on their phones because they can do that, because they know how to do that. And that is totally appropriate. And here's the interesting thing, right? There are people in the audience who didn't grow up texting, right? And didn't grow up checking, you know, what's checking facts on the phone, right? Because we didn't, we didn't have all that. And so this is the interesting thing about what we used to have, and people need to break themselves out of this mentality. In this country, we used to have a circumstance where even if the media was wrong, and let's be clear, the media was often wrong. I'm still waiting for the correction on the Vietnam War. Um, but but it, was one vo it was one conversation, right? We had, a, we had a relatively coherent national conversation in this country. And you could be way on the edge of it. You could be in the John Birch Society, or you could be in the Communist Party. But, you know, most Americans were having the same conversation. We're not doing that anymore. That is not how this country operates anymore. And it is a really serious issue. You can have a relative and you can have an argument with them about any issue you want to pick, and they will give you their set of facts. And you will give them your set of facts, and they will say, you're wrong. And you say, well, no, but my facts are real. And they'll say, no, my facts are real. And the, this is one of the great challenges of the diminution of media in this country. I do not want a genius media that tells us everything, and I don't think you can ever have it, and I don't think the media ever was perfect at all. But I do think that one of the things that happens when we diminish traditional media, right, when we keep, when we keep you know, having our newspapers just obliterated and become almost nothing, right, empty shells of themselves, when our television news is all weather and sports and very little else, when we end up with so much diminished down that the broader conversation we have is not one where we have shared meanings anymore. That's, that's a dysfunction. And you know, other countries aren't that way. Do you know, in Germany or Japan or Norway or many countries around the world, they have, hey, and we have a dog here. I like that. I've got to believe that dog belongs to someone. Yeah, there we go. But uh, in, what I'm saying is that in countries around the world where they have a strong public broadcasting system and where they have strong, I strong independent media or at least functional media, they have a much better national discourse. When we, our di diminution of media and our failure to fund public media in this country and creates a situation where we live in our silos, we live in our separate places. And that, you're right. Then, being right, there is no arbiter of what is right anymore. My friend Chris Hayes wrote a book about this. It's a very good book. It came out about a year ago, in which he argued that that's the real change in America over the last 20, 30 years, is that all of the, that which was an arbiter, you know, where we said, okay, I may not like it, but Walter Cronkite says that segregation is bad, and, you know, um, we're losing that as a country, and we ought to worry about that. Again, I don't want a one-size-fits-all media. I don't think it's healthy. But I do want some, some places we can go to where we have reference points, which I think we increasingly lack. And what fills that void, what fills that void is campaign ads. It's the truth. That's the void. When we, have, when we do not have you know, any place to go to where it's sort of some kind of even failed neutral arbiter, we end up in a situation where whoever has the most money can create the conversation they want. And that is why global warming is not taken seriously. By a, you know, we have polling that shows close to half of people have questions, doubts about global warming. Why is that? No place else in the world is that the case. They don't disbelieve in other countries. We disbelieve here because people spent a lot of money to make folks disbelieve.